Hello, I'm Stan Rhodes. Marijuana is a polarizing topic to discuss, and people are often very passionate about their views. This passion can sometimes lead to skewed facts about marijuana, what's true and what isn't. Well, today we're going to debunk some marijuana myths. And to do this, three people are with me today, each with a different area of expertise with extensive backgrounds in science, policy, and law enforcement. Let me introduce them. First, Jason Poor has more than a dozen years of experience in law enforcement. He has spent much of that time investigating marijuana growing operations and narcotics violations in Tennessee. Dr. Kevin Sabet is a marijuana policy expert and has spent much of his career advising the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, known as ONDCP, under three presidents. And Dr. Susan Weiss is a scientist and senior advisor to the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA. Now, before I begin this discussion about marijuana with my guests, let's see how some coalitions in Massachusetts have made it their mission to debunk marijuana myths. If I wanted to, I could go get some right now. It's, ver it's really available. I'd say marijuana use is definitely more prevalent in our school than it used to be. Most kids say tobacco is gross, and they, so they turn towards marijuana. They think it's not why, why do you smoke marijuana, it's why shouldn't you smoke marijuana. People think that getting high makes them feel better, and they like to be high, so why shouldn't they? And they don't believe marijuana has any negative effects on them. Many parents at Alley's Massachusetts school don't see any problems with pot either. You've got a lot of parents now that come in and they'll look at me as a vice principal and they'll say, Mark, what's the big deal? It's just marijuana. It's not a big deal. We had parents flat out say, you know, I'd rather have my kids smoking pot than drinking. I feel like it's, it's less harmful. In Massachusetts, the relaxed attitude towards marijuana began in earnest after voters approved a measure in 2008. It decriminalized an ounce or less of marijuana and muddied the waters about marijuana use in the state. I would talk to adults in the community that they were confused uh, about decriminalization and they really thought it was legalization. The new law changed the penalty for possession from a criminal offense to a civil fine. It's really not enforceable. The only option the city would have theoretically would be to put a lien on the person's house but um, most kids and, and most marijuana users may not have houses and the city obviously isn't going to go through that expense for $100. We do see it as a joke. We see it as uh, sending the wrong message to youth. And we just see it as pretty much unenforceable. But sadly, most sadly, it's the will of at least the population that voted for it. Many teens don't seem to see any risk in possessing marijuana. Most of them think, you know, it's, it's almost legal. It's decriminalized. It's, it's out there. It's readily available. And it's one of those things where they feel like, you know, I never have more than an ounce anyway, so I'm not going to get arrested, I'm not going to get in trouble. And even if I do, nothing's going to happen because it's a slap on the wrist, it's a ticket. Work is underway to try to bring back the possibility of criminal penalties for minors caught with marijuana. What we did was put together a bill that treats possession of marijuana in the same way that we treat possession of alcohol for minors, with the understanding that in each case you haven't uh, matured enough yet to make formative good decisions about the use of those substances. Data is showing many teens in Massachusetts communities don't see any dangers to smoking marijuana. Since that law passed in 2008, kids' perception of how harmful marijuana is decreased. Um, our data uh, two years ago showed that about roughly 60% of kids thought regular use of marijuana was harmful. Two years later, in our most recent survey this past March, that rate dropped 10 percentage points to 49%. Student surveys showed marijuana usage among teens is becoming more prevalent. We saw um, a little bit of a decrease in alcohol use among youth, but an uptick in marijuana use. And this was aligning with what law enforcement was seeing, physicians was, were seeing. So we put this together and we said, you know, this is an issue that we have to address and, um, and what can we do in the community to do that. With many coalitions around the state seeing the same problems with marijuana, coalition leaders decided uniting was the best way to serve their individual communities. Massachusetts Prevention Alliance is a group of um, different people in the prevention field working at the lo local level as a, um, jo joining as a united force 
to address policy issues that impact youth in the state. As a group, MAPA has standardized talking points for coalitions, sued the state about the language for a new ballot initiative, and is ready to continue the fight, no matter what. It's a beast. It's been a freight train. And we are, um, a, we are a grassroots mobilization effort with very limited resources. And we're going up against very well-organized, very uh, um, deeply funded oppositional force. It's not over. It's never going to be over. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's going to be a constant battle until the public opinion on this issue turns. Well, what do you think? Is this uh, what they're dealing with in Massachusetts? Is it, is it pretty typical? I mean, uh, have attitudes relaxed like this all around the country? Um, that's what we're seeing. NIDA does a, um, a survey of teens in 8th, 10th, and 12th grade every year, and what we've been seeing over the last few years is that attitudes have relaxed, and that goes along with increases in use. And very disturbingly, we're seeing increases in use even among um, students who are using it every day. So there's something like 6% of high school seniors that smoke marijuana every day, which means that they're going into school high or they're not able to learn or perform the way they could if they were in their normal state. Right. But it's not just the kids, it's the parents too who seem to think there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, I think parents have their experience from maybe when they went to college or when they were younger, uh, they smoked marijuana without much consequence and they think that that experience can be transferred onto their kids um, with their kids smoking with very little consequence. But the, the thing that throws a ringer into that argument is that you know, today's marijuana is not the marijuana mm -hmm. of the 60s and 70s. It's, it was called weed for a reason. Uh, it was 1% of its active ingredient. Now we're seeing upwards of 10, 15, in some places 25%. And that is what gets you high. And so different drug is having different health effects today. Jason, interesting, decriminalization, not legalization here. Yeah, that law enforcement's experiencing a lot of the same issues. Uh, they're often questioned, why are we enforcing marijuana laws when we could be out enforcing other drug laws? And uh, a lot of times the public doesn't realize the marijuana of today is not the marijuana they may be accustomed mm -hmm. to. So it is making an uphill battle for enforcement efforts also. Okay, are you ready to uh, debunk some myths here? Let's sure. take our first Sorry. one. Marijuana is harmless and non-addictive. Yes, no, maybe? No. No. Marijuana has a number of harms, but one of them is that it can be addictive. And we know that among people who try marijuana, something like 9% of them will develop an addiction at some point in their life, which means that they have trouble stopping use, which means that they are recognizing that it's having an um, impairing effect on their lives. And we know that when you start young, the chances are even greater. So something like one in six adolescents that use marijuana may become addicted, and 25 to 50% of people that use it every day. And that's just one of its harms. And, and does it lead to other things? It certainly can lead to other things. We do know that people that use other drugs, for example, usually use marijuana first, but it doesn't necessarily do that. But I think we want to also focus on the fact that marijuana in itself mm -hmm. can be problematic. It affects driving. It affects um, ability to think well, to make good decisions, all of those things that can be extremely important, again, especially when someone is young and uh, apt to make some pretty risky decisions anyway. Is someone apt to die from smoking marijuana? Not directly. It's not, it doesn't seem to produce any sort of direct overdose effects. However, it does impair driving, and so there are people that are in car wrecks and that may die as a result of that. We know that your risk of being in a car accident is about double if you're using marijuana, mm -hmm. and it's particularly problematic if you're using marijuana and alcohol. Even small amounts of each, which on their own might not be problematic, can be much more problematic if you are trying to drive. I know we're getting into the scientific uh, portion of this right off the bat. What about cancer risks? Cancer risks we know a lot less about. Um, the, recent the data is just not there yet? Th it's just not there yet. Um, there were some studies that seemed to indicate there were changes in the lung that mm -hmm. are precancerous, but in studies that are looking at people that have lung cancer, there doesn't seem to be a specific risk associated with marijuana. However, um, 
oftentimes people use marijuana in combination with tobacco. Some of the ways in which they smoke it have tobacco in it, so that of course is an increased risk for cancer. And I wouldn't rule it out yet. I think we just don't know at this mm -hmm. point. Right. I mean, one of the things we saw I think in August of 2012 was a new study linking, very strongly linking testicular cancer for the first time and regular marijuana use. But I think beyond cancer, uh, we can be, or we should be concerned about uh, obviously the effects, as Dr. Weiss has said, on, on the lungs, but also on the heart. Um, the effects of especially aggravating pre-existing heart conditions. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue that, you know, in the last 20 years we've learned so much more about that we didn't know before is this link with mental illness, um, specifically schizophrenia and psychosis. We now have studies over, um, you know, sort of large populations following the same people for, you know, 20, 30 years, these so-called population level studies that are following people and seeing that independent of other pre-existing conditions, uh, we're seeing how strongly uh, marijuana use, especially heavy use, not surprising, is linked to, uh, in t to mental illness. And it, that also, by the way, includes depression and anxiety. So, you know, what, what's ironic about the health harms, I think, over the last 30 years is we've learned so much more about, um, you know, how harmful marijuana use can be. It's mm -hmm. clearly not as harmful as heroin or cocaine, but it can be very harmful, but it's totally incongruent with the attitudes which have become more lax. So there's a scientific sort of incongruence there right. with the reality. Now, now Jason, on the, on the legal side or on the law enforcement side, do you see people who think this absolutely has no effect? on them? Oh yes. Uh, you know, we're starting to see, and if you go to any community, you have medicines that are uh, the number one drug problem in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. And they are now starting to see marijuana more as a medicine or a harmless uh, substance, you know, and when you take all of that in, also the time frame that the, the person starts using marijuana can play an effect too. And, and we see that a lot with uh, offenders over, you know, a period of time. But if they start as a child or if the brain is fully developed, can they fully recover from the marijuana use? You know, that becomes a reoccurring question in a lot of the, the studies and stuff that I've uh, reviewed. So, it, you know, it's definitely going to create even more of a law enforcement problem. The less emphasis that's put on the health and the, the dangers of it when we really don't know for sure exactly how much of a danger it truly is. Dr. Weiss, back to the science of it. How is it affecting mental development, brain development and IQ? Um, I think that's something that's been very interesting and I think that's also a message that parents need to hear when they're thinking that marijuana is not really dangerous for their kids. There was a recent study that came out that's been sort of one of the most convincing studies. I mean, for a long time we've been talking about marijuana affecting your ability to think and memory, but this study was an interesting study because it followed a thousand people from the age of 13 to 38 and found that there was a change in their IQ that happened between that period and that was at 13 this was before these people were actually using marijuana and they were able to show that people that started before age 18 and were the heaviest users in particular mm -hmm. of marijuana showed the greatest decline in their IQ no parent wants their kids to be losing IQ points and it was more than just IQ it was also effects on other types of cognitive function and they also even contacted people who were in the lives of the of the people who were marijuana users at age 38 and they reported changes in their mood, they reported problems with their ability to do things on an everyday level, even people who had stopped using. So this is really kind of the first very strong evidence that using marijuana early can actually have some long lasting effects on brain development and on your ability to function cognitively. So those who stopped it still had a lasting impact. When they, if they started when they were young, it still did, at least up until the point at which the study mm -hmm. concluded. It doesn't mean that it never goes away, but it's a pretty long time period that you're talking about. Are, are we talking about, is marijuana intoxicating? I mean, is yeah. it addictive? Yes, say? it is intoxicating, and I mean, it does make people or feel you high. Think like alcohol and so forth, is it a different kind of intoxication? Yes, it's, it is somewhat different, although there's certain overlaps there, but I think the way that people feel on it is a little bit different, but just like alcohol and just like most drugs of abuse, it affects the parts of the brain that are associated with reward and that make people feel good and that make people take something again. These parts of the brain are critical for survival, mm -hmm. and drugs tap into these, and they tap into them usually in a sort of 
stronger fashion than some of the natural rewards in people's lives. And that's why drugs can change the brain and they can take over someone's ability to enjoy other things in their life and get them focused right. instead on getting the drug. Right. So and that includes is, marijuana. Right. So there is a risk. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a message to parents and to kids and others talking about this is that this isn't your Woodstock weed anymore. It's much more harmful and you're taking a risk. Does it mean 100% that you're going to have major problems with marijuana? No. In fact, most people use marijuana stop after the first time and they don't have those, mm. those harmful effects. But for the minority of all drug users that, that do keep using, um, and, and the minority of cigarette users, the minority of, of alcohol users, there, there can be substantial problems. So you, now we're learning more about IQ and learning and memory and driving and mental health and cancer and we can go on and on. You are taking a, a risk. And so you know, it's important to get the, the risks out there so that people know just what kind of risks they're, they're taking. Get them out there and hopefully they will listen. Let's yeah. move and on to our next, well, go ahead, quickly. Well, I was just to sort of reemphasize the point right. that you were making that even for a drug like heroin, we know right. that something like 25% of people that have mm -hmm. ever used heroin become addicted to it. Yet nobody would not take that as a serious concern about heroin. And with marijuana, it may be about 10% of people right. that use it, but that still makes it a problem for many users. And again, with the numbers of people that we see using it, there's something like 4.5 million people each year that meet criteria criteria for clinical criteria for it being um, dependent upon marijuana. Right. Most people who drink and drive do not get into an accident and kill anybody. Most people who smoke cigarettes do not get lung cancer. We don't want to send messages to go drink and drive right. and to try your chance of getting lung cancer because you likely won't get it. It's this exact same thing with marijuana for a different set of harms. Okay, time's up. We have to move on to another myth. Marijuana in all forms is medicine. <laughs> is it? No. <laughs> There are ingredients in marijuana that we know can have medicinal effects, and so we certainly don't want to make the case that there's nothing about marijuana because that there could are people, be. Right, there are people that say, hey, it, it helps me, I need it, it relaxes me, it uh, helps me eliminate headaches or whatever it might be. Right, and, and actually one of the ingredients in marijuana, THC, which is the main chemical that makes you high but also has other effects, um, it, in fact, is, is available as a drug right now, Marinol, and it's available to treat the nausea associated with chemotherapy and also the extreme weight loss associated with AIDS. And scientists are very excited about studying the ingredients in marijuana. In fact, by studying marijuana, a whole new signaling system in the brain was discovered in the body, which is important for um, brain development. It's important for regulating mood, for pain, for all of the effects that we know marijuana has an effect mm. on. However, what, we're, what the scientists are focusing on and where we see the, the potential in the future is in these specific ingredients that might be able to target s systems more specifically without some of the side effects that marijuana has. Yeah, we know the marijuana plant, right, has some medical, um, you know, therapeutic effects, but we don't necessarily need to smoke crude, raw marijuana to get those positive effects. So in the same way, we don't ask people who want to use morphine to smoke opium, Mm -hmm. You know, to grow opium right. on their own and, and smoke it, we, we say, well, we've synthesized morphine in a lab, it's isolated, you're not going to be smoking it, it's, it's one of the ingredients. It's the same thing with marijuana. We don't need to smoke marijuana to get its potential medical effects. And you're right, it's a very exciting area of science. There's more and more medications we'll probably see come on the market, and, and that's a great development, but it doesn't mean you smoke the raw plant. Excellent points of view. Well, we we're going to move on. There are differing opinions to this debate. There are those who push for medical marijuana saying it's about healing pain. And then there are those with the Massachusetts Prevention Alliance who say it has nothing at all to do with good medicine. We don't vote on a medicine. We don't, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an issue of public opinion. And, and most of our, all of our food and drugs go through the FDA process. Why is this a, why does this get its own special process of becoming marketable? That's not the best way to do, to, to determine what, what is medicine. I mean, people don't cook things up in their basement and then say, hey, I like this, this is great, let's, let's put it out to the voters and see if they think it's medicine. That's not how, that's not how medicine is determined here. It's unlikely that if you were in pain after uh, an operation or you were in an emergency room having had a bad fracture, that the doctor would come up to you and say, I want to help you with your pain, so I'd like you to smoke some opium. 
what they're li more likely to do is come up to you and say, I can see you in terrible pain, and I'm going to give you some medication called morphine. Morphine was isolated, characterized, uh, standardized, purified, and now is available as a medication to be dosed appropriately for patients that could benefit from that. The Food and Drug Administration provides the responsible avenue for establishing the safety and effectiveness of medication. And from my point of view, that's the route that we need to go. To bypass that uh, and put physicians in the middle of a, of a, a process that they're not um, equipped to um, participate in, to write a letter of certification that has no expiration date that basically says, gee, go ahead and use marijuana for the rest of your life. I mean, that is, there's no medication that I would ever do something like that. I want their health and well-being to improve. Well, that video segment brings up several issues, and let's start with what is considered medicine in this country. Let's put the question out. How does the FDA determine what is medicine, what is and isn't? The FDA um, bases their decisions on very carefully controlled clinical trials that demonstrate that a medication that is very well characterized, um, as was brought out very nicely in this last segment, um, you know how much of a drug is in a pill, you know exactly what the ingredients are. So they, they decide on the basis of clinical trials whether or not a drug is effective for what it is intended to treat. At the same time, they look at the risks associated with it and what are the potential problems. And, and on that basis, they can make a decision, and then they can make a decision uh, recommending on who, who these drugs are who appropriate to be used for and what are the warnings that need to be associated with them or what are the things that a physician mm -hmm. needs to consider when prescribing them. So based on that, should marijuana go through this process? It's very difficult to get a plant through this process. I think that's one of the um, reasons that it, it hasn't gone through it, because plants are going to vary every single time that you use them. What exactly but this is this? isn't the, the first plant that we've had turned into a medication, is it? Yes, it's in, uh, no, you're right. In, we, don't, we don't use plants as medications, but we use ingredients from the okay, plants. Right. And that is something that is being done with the marijuana plant. In fact, there's a drug called Sativex, which is not yet approved in this country. It's approved in other places. And it's actually a, it's two chemicals that were derived from the marijuana plant, THC and another chemical called cannabidiol. Mm -hmm. And they are together part of a medication which is taken, um, which is, uh, taken um, directly um, uh, sprayed into the mouth. Okay. And it's been useful now for multiple sclerosis, for spasms associated with it, and for pain. And it's going through, cl and it's going through clinical trials in this country now. Right. Right. Jason, how can you tell when someone has a legal right to have it and really they don't? Well, you know, it gets down to um, state laws, federal laws, under federal law, uh, no one is allowed to have it. Um, fortunately, uh, in Tennessee, where uh, I've spent most of my law enforcement experience, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have any type of medical marijuana laws, but even there, it still comes up when we uh, conduct a raid on a marijuana grower. They may have anywhere from 10 plants to 300 plants. And on more than one occasion, they brought up, well, I'm growing it for my back pain or I'm growing it for my headaches and, you know, different types of things. And, you know, and if you look at drug enforcement uh, over the years, it's always kind of derived out of using a some type of chemical or some type of substance for some type of mm -hmm. treatment. And, you know, that's kind of how everything come out of cocaine and methamphetamine. It all had a legitimate purpose at one time. Um, and it was misused and abused, and that's how it gets right. into the scheduling process. And in the areas that, that they do have uh, medical marijuana, you know, we're seeing the fraudulent cards or even those that go for cards may have something as minute as a headache. And they go see a doctor. They pay $250. They say they have chronic headaches, and now they have a marijuana card. So, you know, the, there's no formal standardization nationwide. So, so paint for me the picture. Who is the patient and who is writing 
the prescription? Well, we know that in these states that have medical, so-called medical marijuana, the average patient, uh, in California there was a study of 4,000 users with cards, and the average user was a 32-year-old white male with no history of chronic illness and a history of drug and alcohol abuse. Um, the vast majority of, of users in a, in a more, even more recent study uh, said that they were using for headaches and for relaxation, and they're probably right. I mean, marijuana, I'm sure, relaxes you. <laughs> the point is, uh, is that what we constitute as medicine, is that what voters, is that the bill of goods that voters are sold? I think Jason brought up an excellent point about history. Why do we have the FDA in the first place? Well, a hundred years ago, people were selling snake oil and, by the way, heroin and cocaine, promising every single cure that you could imagine. And Congress said, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're, we know that in this country states have auto autonomy, but we need to make sure that the medicine you get in California is the same, um, you know, bottle of aspirin you get in Maine. And to do that, we need a uniform process, and that's what the FDA process is. So the idea that we want have compassion for the sick and dying, yet we want to send them to a dispensary that you know has maybe a 22-year-old kid behind the counter with no medical mm. experience mm -hmm. handing out a crude plant, or do we want to send them to a pharmacist that can dispense a pre prescribed medication that's gone through science? I mean, what's more compassion, I think, is the question. Wow. Well, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll talk some more about myths about marijuana. Drugs are talking to your kids. Are you? Find the right words at drugfree.org. And welcome back to our program, Debunking Marijuana Myths. I have Jason Poor, Dr. Kevin Sabet, and Dr. Susan Weiss with me. And we're going to take another myth here, and this one is going towards law enforcement, Jason. Law enforcement has better things to do. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, you know, when you look at it in that aspect, uh, law enforcement always has better things to do if you're the target of the investigation or uh, if you think that, you know, the state troopers should be out there writing speeding tickets and, um, you know, there's always going to be an argument with law enforcement. When it comes to marijuana, it's just like everything. You have, uh, you know, teams or you have organizations that focus on that. You have alcohol enforcement agencies or units. You have drug enforcement agencies or units. You have a homicide division. So uh, overall, you know, we are a country of laws and uh, if the laws are on the books, it's our job to enforce them, not necessarily always what the public would think that we need to be enforcing. And, and that's where it comes into if you disagree with the enforcement, then change the law. So do you think the views differ about this, Kevin, in other parts of the country? Yeah, I mean, obviously it depends where you go, but I think that there's an overall view that law enforcement is focusing all of its resources on marijuana, especially marijuana possession, because if you look at the arrest statistics that the FBI puts out, you know, 800,000 people were arrested mainly for possession, not all. Uh, but what it gets lost in those numbers is that the vast majority of those who actually get cited for uh, possession arrests are not being handcuffed and taken to jail and spending time in jail. Now, there are some glaring exceptions like in New York City where they have a special policy, but in most places in, the, in this country, that kind of uh, sort of arrest is no, more, no greater than a parking or speeding ticket. In some places, you're required to go see the judge the next week. So what's more important is what is law enforcement doing beyond arrest? In other words, are our jails and prisons locked up with people with marijuana violations? And, and the, the answer is no, not even by any 
stretch of the imagination. It's about one tenth of one percent. Uh, a Department of Justice survey of those in state prisons are there for any kind of marijuana possession violation. Uh, and if you look at, of course, federal prisons, obviously that's, that's, there's no marijuana possession. So this idea that law enforcement is arresting everybody and throwing them in jail for marijuana possession, it's not not squared with reality. Not, not true. Jason, are people, are, are, is law enforcement out there just looking for people who are growing or smoking pot or both? No, and that's, that's one of the misconceptions a lot of times. Uh, let's say that uh, we catch someone with 10 marijuana plants or 100 marijuana plants or 500 marijuana plants growing in their backyard. They will often get probation, pay a fine, and then uh, while they're on that probationary period, they'll get some other charge, and that's what ends up putting them in prison. And law enforcement, you know, we're, we're kind of a answer the, the question as it's addressed to us. And a lot of times, if we just sit around with nothing else to do, mm -hmm. it would be one thing, but a lot of times, uh, people don't actually see everything that's going on in a uh, organization or in a city and you know they just happen to see what's going on that day or the, the problem of that day and you know when it comes down to it marijuana is really not as enforced or not given the attention within the law enforcement field that it probably should um, in whether it's homicides or uh, you know any type of assaults it's not uncommon to find marijuana use being involved not to say that marijuana use is causing that mm -hmm. but uh, home invasions fact? yeah uh, in mm -hmm. California in the news you'll read about home invasions of grow houses are on the rise and even home invasions of houses without marijuana grows are, are there other crimes that are associated with marijuana use Yes, uh, you know, the, the, Give me full, an idea. Uh, the full spectrum of marijuana use, whether you're the user, the, uh, the actual grower, the transporter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it could be anything from uh, someone committing these assaults using marijuana or someone using marijuana becoming a victim because of their altered state of mind and, you know, just like with other club drugs or alcohol use. So there, there's really a lot of the scenarios that we've not really addressed and law enforcement hasn't done a good job of expressing those issues. Mm -hmm. Right. And we know we know drugs and crime are linked in three fundamental ways. So the first way being um, the crime that you cause in order to get money to buy drugs. The second being the crime that you cause as a result of being high on a certain drug. And the third being sort of turf wars over selling. Marijuana doesn't quite f fit in that third category at all. But for the first two, you know, crimes committed while on the drug and also crimes committed to get money for the drug, especially there's a growing literature looking at juvenile crime and actually linking juvenile crime and marijuana use in those two fundamental ways. So, you know, this idea that it sort of just mellows you out and, you, and, and you're never going to commit a crime on it doesn't really square with statistics. You know, is it the violence-inducing drug that a drug like alcohol is? No, it's, it's not, and frankly, most drugs aren't. Um, but it does have some of those properties if you look back at the literature. Now, the next question I wanted to go to was, uh, is marijuana growth and growing considered a white-collar crime? In, in many areas, um, it, it's downplayed on the, the criminal activity involved in it. For example, in your agricultural areas, um, in East Tennessee, in the Appalachian area uh, that uh, we eradicate marijuana from, it is often hard to get criminal charges brought on someone because everybody in the community knows that the people growing marijuana are spending their money in uh, the community or they're spending their money you know around the community and yeah it is mar but marijuana is not that bad a drug so they're really not harming anybody all we're doing is profiting from the sale so you know and I guess a white collar crime may not be the best way to describe it but when you consider the the penalties revolving around white collar crime compared to the penalties with marijuana it is common in a lot of those situations all right well let's move on to our next myth and that is and we hear it all the time, since alcohol and tobacco are legal, we should legalize marijuana. Well, <laughs> well, we know that we have enormous burdens because tobacco and alcohol are legal because they are the most commonly used drugs. And now we see all of the different um, health associated burdens associ that are linked to those drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, um, violence, as, as, um, as Kevin just said. Uh, as well as driving accidents. If we legalize marijuana, we're likely going to increase the numbers of people that are using marijuana, and then we're going to have a whole other set of problems that are associated with it, including the cognitive problems that, were, that I mentioned earlier and people not doing so well, but also problems associated with health and potentially with mental illness and also with drug driving, and we do know that 
marijuana can impair driving. So legalizing it is just putting out yet another substance that has addictive properties and that has other problems for the country and making it more available for people to use throughout their lives. Has there been the kind of look in the crystal ball to the future, if it was legalized, <laughs> what kind of additional cost we would be looking at? Yeah, actually Rand, uh, Rand Corporation did a good study on, on that when they were looking at what would happen if California legalized and they found immediately that the price of marijuana would be reduced by about 80 percent and because the price would fall so dramatically they, they expected a significant increase in consumption you know, by how much nobody knows. Uh, but there were also issues of tax market, uh, tax evasion, gray markets. In other words, if, if you have, you know, if your justification for legalization is that you're going to tax it like we do alcohol and tobacco, then the idea idea is, well, a lot of people will evade that tax and they'll, they'll actually go underground still because they can make a profit and not have to put the taxes on it. You know, people talk about the taxes related to alcohol and tobacco and, and, you know, and they say, well, we could always get tax revenue if we legalize marijuana. We, for every dollar of alcohol or tobacco revenue that we get, we spend about eight to ten dollars in lost social costs. So it's a terrible a business proposition to say that we would legalize an addictive substance. And, yeah. And there would still be law enforcement issues associated yes. with it because likely it wouldn't be legal for for minors and then so you have to sort of figure out how to prevent um, the use, its use by minors. You'd have the, again, issues about driving while intoxicated. That would be something else. So it wouldn't get rid of all the law enforcement issues anyway and probably wouldn't get rid of the ones that are the, the most mm -hmm. problematic or most common. Might increase your workload. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look at how well we enforce alcohol and tobacco laws now. Um, I mean, I think we do a good job at it, but we still don't get everyone. So do we really need to add one more category to that regulatory or that enforcement section that's already fighting an uphill battle at times anyway? So perhaps you might even need another branch of enforcement to be able to go after this. Oh, you, definitely. You, you certainly do. Jason's exactly right. We arrest a million more people a year for alcohol-related incidents than for all drugs combined. Mm. And that's because of driving while intoxicated, public drunkenness, and uh, the uh, um, violation of laws, of liquor laws and regulations. And that, by the way, that does not cover the violence related to alcohol. That's a whole other category. Mm -hmm. But 2.7 2, 2 million arrests a year for alcohol, 1.6 for drugs. So I, I don't see how legalization is going to ease any kind of burden on law mm -hmm. enforcement. Well, let's move on to another myth, and that is legalization will end crimes involving marijuana. Your head's shaking, Jason. Yeah, I, I, no. I don't see that happening. Um, you know, we can use California as a good example. When you look at the increase of the home invasions, like I just mentioned, and even residents that live in these marijuana growing areas are having to go out and secure their homes more because uh, in one city, I think it was one in six or somewhere around that number, houses have marijuana growing. So people started attacking that neighborhood and in home invading that neighborhood looking for marijuana grows. And so you've got all types of um, related crime when it comes to the actual growing and the location. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the transportation or even the dispensaries. You know, if you want to go somewhere that deal, mainly deals with cash and uh, a marijuana in a usable mm -hmm. form, right. you go rob a dispensary. So, you know, it, it's creating a lot more of an environment for crime and uh, victimization at times than I think what a lot of people realize. For the states that have legalized, what kind of crime increase have we seen what, of what time? Well, no states yet legalize marijuana, but we can look at other legalized sets of drugs. Yeah, or yeah. decriminalized, but we can look at prescription drugs. I mean, those are legal and they're actually supposed to be very tightly regulated because only doctors can dispense them, but we've seen the spate of pharmacy robberies. We've seen, um, you know, the fact the crime that, sur that surrounds a prescription drug market, and that is another class of legal drugs. So again, I don't see how our examples of alcohol, tobacco, or prescription drugs can give us any comfort that we'd be able to legalize marijuana in a safe way. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what about the notion that if marijuana was legalized, uh, it would eliminate the idea of a black market? I think that goes back to this yeah. tax evasion. I mean, the, the black market would have every incentive to stay there because you have um, you know, local and state and federal governments taxing that those drugs in a very high way in order to quote unquote pay for prevention and treatment, which never happens. I, last time I checked, the lottery did not save public education in any state, which is what it was uh, supposed to do. Uh, so I don't think we're going to be paying for prevention and treatment, yet 
we're going to have those high taxes, so you're still going to have the underground market there to undercut those taxes. The, the, one of the biggest black markets today in the United States, growing at least, growth rate, is not from an illegal drug. It's from tobacco. And that, you know, in the Bronx, there was an estimate of two-thirds of the tobacco consumed there comes from the underground market because the taxes are so high in New York, you, it's very easy to bring a U-Haul up of, of cartons and cartons of cigarettes from mm -hmm. South Carolina, North Carolina, up for eight hours, up to ten hours, up to New York. Uh, so again, we're seeing it with tobacco. I don't see why we wouldn't see it with marijuana. And not to mention, if let's go out on a limb and say they do legalize it, look at the alcohol industry. You have uh, alcohol proof, and you have the amount of proof or the amount of alcohol by volume or by weight. So you know you've got a percentage of the alcohol, and it's taxed on that. Marijuana, you know, let's say that it's 15% THC. Okay, well, let's say the U.S. only legalizes the 10% and, and lower THC. Well, that's going to increase the market for the black uh, or the black market mm -hmm. for the high-grade, high-potency marijuana, which we're starting to see more and more of. So, really, all you do is kind of close the market and, and push the high-grade stuff a little farther underground, increase the profits, and then you just legalize it for a very small percentage. And then again, you're losing money due to the lack of regulation and the overall cost compared to the enforcement of the high grade stuff. So there's an ebb and flow to all of this. All right, let's take a look at another myth. Legal and taxed marijuana will solve government budgetary problems. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no one's jumping on this right away. Speechless. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how ignorant that yeah. statement is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think as Kevin just pointed out, you know, the, the cost that, you know, the amount of money that is being taxed and that's, that's helping is going to be offset by the health problems, the loss of productivity, all of the other factors that we know that we see for tobacco and that we see for alcohol right now, which, which are taxed and which we do. Are, are there numbers out there, projections in terms of if it was legalized, what kind of numbers, what kind of money we would be looking at? It's very hard to do those projections because we don't know what the consumption numbers would mm -hmm. look at. We can imagine, let's be modest and imagine a 20% increase in marijuana use, which I think is modest uh, under legalization. Um, you know, given the fact that all illegal drugs combined cost us about $200 billion, and marijuana is the most consumed drug of, of that class, uh, you know, again, the idea... But a total umbrella, $200 yeah, billion. For, that's for all illegal drugs combined. We don't even know the percentage of marijuana. But let's even say, even though marijuana is the vast majority of use, let's say it only covers, let's say it's 20% of those harms. So 20% of $200 billion is a lot of money. And if those, that was increased by that, I don't see how we'd be able to collect any tax revenue. Uh, to offset that. Mm -hmm. What about social costs? Social costs, um, I, you know, I, again, I come back to this study that just came out recently and some other work that's been going on that's showing that marijuana is affecting brain development, especially when it's used by youth. And so the idea that we're growing mm -hmm. a generation that's going to be less competent than they can be is, to me, a tremendous social cost and is going to affect the competitiveness of our students and of our country in areas of science and all kinds of areas. So that's just the, you know, and that's the sort of subtle social cost. That's right. not even about kind of criminal justice and other types of costs. I think the competitiveness uh, issue is really important because if we, right now, now there are 6% of high school seniors who admit to using marijuana every day. That 6% today is virtually unemployable. Why? because we know most companies drug test for pre-employment drug screens. So, you know, you may say that you got through high school with B's and A's and you're fine and you're going to get a job, but good luck actually being able to go to that job or perform at that job if you're going to be regularly drug tested. And if it's legal, companies are still going to drug test. So people often say, well, if it's legal, then it's not an issue anymore. No, companies test for alcohol. So it's, it is a huge issue. It's also, you know, the 6% is actually a low number yeah, because that's the, that's the number of people that are still in high school. That's exactly you know, right. So that doesn't include the people that right. have already dropped already out dropped that out. were mm -hmm. using it every day. So. Well, we're going to take another quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation on myths about marijuana. What are you doing? What am I? A burrito? No. A larva? A larva? No. I'm a joint. Actually, you're a little too fat to be a joint. 
So you know about joints? There's no wrong way to talk to your kids about drugs. Need help? Get help. Visit our website at drugfree.org. JV Women's 200 meter medley relay. Do we have a swimmer for lane four? Do we have a swimmer for lane four? Just tell your teammates you missed the race because you were getting stoned. Swimmers, take your mark. They'll understand. Welcome back to our program and our next myth. There are countries where marijuana has been decriminalized, and I'm guessing the Netherlands is an example here. Is uh, marijuana legal there? Well, it, it's sort of de facto legalized. I mean, to be in line with uh, international treaties, which, by the way, is another issue. Uh, the United States is signatory to UN drug laws that say that drugs will not be legal. Uh, so there are implications. But in order to be in line with that, the Netherlands has basically not enforced their marijuana laws. And they've done that since 1976. And so it, it provides a good lesson of you know, what has happened. And what's interesting is that for the first 10 years or so, we did not see an increase in use in the Netherlands. Um, people had prior anti-drug attitudes. It just wasn't really well known what the law was. They were worried that maybe the government you know, is not really being truthful when they're saying they won't enforce. So there was a little trepidation. Then in the mid-80s, I think the light bulb went off in terms of the money light bulb and people started realizing wait a minute we have a law here that we're not making any money off of let's do something so you saw the rapid commercialization of marijuana especially in Amsterdam but throughout the Netherlands and you know you saw people trying to attract partner countries or neighboring countries saying you know come on in tourists and American college students flock to the Netherlands all of a sudden for some reason. Uh, and anyway, there was this huge commercialization effort. And so what happened after that is we saw a tripling in youth marijuana use for lifetime use by 1996, those 12 years. And we saw a doubling in annual use for young adults in the Netherlands. So we actually did see an increase in use within those countries. Now people will say, well, it's much lower than the U.S. Well, of course it is. It always has been. The drug use levels in Europe have always been lower than the, than the United States. but. What we've now seen 30 years on is the Netherlands is the top country in Europe for marijuana dependence. And I don't think that's an accident given the availability and access. And actually the big story now in the Netherlands is that they're doing a 180 degree reversal. Um, they're reversing their policies, they're closing, they've closed 70% of their coffee shops. They're allowing only residents, only Dutch residents, Dutch nationals to actually buy marijuana. That's a huge change coming into effect in 2013. So they're doing, a, they're doing a big been change. Made? Why, why, what was well, there the was an outcry by the public and, and others mm -hmm. to their politicians and saying, we don't want our, our little, you know, cute Dutch villages uh, mm -hmm. that are all of a sudden becoming marijuana villages and they're becoming magnets for crime. I mean, they, they, people had to get their marijuana somewhere in terms of these coffee shops. Are, are there other countries that have followed suit with the Netherlands? N not, not really, not as much. I mean, Spain has these so-called collectives. Not much is known about them. Uh, it's not the extent of that you see in the Netherlands. But really, the Netherlands shows that this idea that we can sort of de facto legalize and separate the markets, the criminal market, they're getting their marijuana from the criminal market. The organized crime is supplying them to the coffee hmm. shops because they're illegal. So the Netherlands said, you know, we'll let people buy it at the coffee shops, but we won't let coffee shops by the you know supply, which obviously so doesn't control. So, so if if in this country, if marijuana became legalized, who would grow it? Who would control it? That's the million dollar question. Uh, you got to look at it. I mean, if we look at the alcohol industry, and we know prohibition didn't work for the alcohol mm -hmm. side of things. Right. Um, you know, we've got regulatory uh, divisions or regulatory agencies that oversee the making of alcohol, the distributing of alcohol, the selling of alcohol and the overall consumption of alcohol. And then, you know, if we look at, and you know, most of that is handled on the state level, but if we look at it across the country, everybody has something a little bit different or a different program that may work, and there's really no uniformity, nor uh, would we say that it's 100% regulated. Our next myth, there is nothing we can do to prevent marijuana use. True, false? Well, yeah, I think we see prevention happening across the country. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we have a we have a really tough road here because we have all of these discussions about how marijuana is a medicine. We have the portrayal of marijuana generally in a very positive way by the media. We don't have movies that show the devastation that marijuana can bring on a young person's life. We show with alcohol, for example, we can show people having a good time and being social, but we also show the downsides. We show car wrecks and we show alcoholism, mm -hmm. and we don't do that at all for marijuana. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the media gives such a, a good perception that there is no harm? I, I think marijuana. it's still a lack of knowledge, a lack of facts, and I think that's really what we need to do to try and improve our prevention effects, and I think putting together this videotape is one part of that, is letting people know that we really do know that marijuana can be harmful and that it can harm a person in a number of different ways. It's different than alcohol, it's different than tobacco, but it has its own set of problems associated with it. But the glamorization within it this gives the message that well there's really no harm to it that you're well, not going to cause any problems there was a time when cocaine was glamorized mm -hmm. i mean we've had we've gone through a number of different things in this country where certain drugs have been considered glamorous if cocaine was for the rich it was not addictive i mean we went right. through all of that until someone died until you know we lost some famous people that overdosed on cocaine and then right. suddenly we realized that not so fast I, I was taken back by the, in our first piece, we were talking about the Massachusetts coalitions, and the first young lady that spoke said, why shouldn't you smoke? There's no harm. And then to have parents say, well, it uh, doesn't bother us. Right. I, I mean, thankfully, we have community anti-drug coalitions and groups like CATCA and others to organize uh, communities around these issues and spread awareness, but it's clearly an uphill battle in terms of the prevention infrastructure in the United States. I think that needs to be looked at again entirely. And, you know, we're talking about alcohol and tobacco. We've obviously made great success in the last 20 years because of the public outcry against smoking uh, and also, uh, to some extent, alcohol in terms of reductions. But uh, I, I'm hoping that we can sort of also put some of that ire against smoking of the same, with these other classes of drugs because we shouldn't have to learn from our painful experience of, you know, living with a tobacco industry that went completely unregulated, that marketed to kids, that, that claim that these were medicinal. Remember, tobacco was medicinal 50 oh, oh years yes. ago. <laughs> right, your doctor, doctor recommends. That's right, doctor, yes. you know. But, so uh, so I, I, I'm, it's worrisome that we're sort of seeing history being repeated again. And the, I think the last thing we'd want is to legalize a substance like marijuana with these industries, by the way, the tobacco industry is greatly in place to become the supplier, going back to your previous question. Um, Jimmy Carter's drug czar, Peter Bourne, a friend of mine that I don't necessarily agree with on a lot of policies, but one of the things he said recently in a Newsweek article that struck me is that, you know, they've seen, even at the White House at that time, how tobacco companies and the tobacco industry is ready to market, produce, and sell marijuana. So I think we should be very worried about that kind of industry uh, that we'd have to wrestle with again. So they're prepared, they're ready to go. Yeah. Do they think, are they, are they pushing it? Are they providing well, there's the There's no impetus? real evidence that, that they're pushing this, and, and the people pushing for it um, you know, are, are usually collectives of marijuana users or that are organized on a national level, or there are a few billionaires that have, uh, have given money to these, yeah. um, so it's difficult. Well, you know, one area we really haven't talked on, uh, touched on, and that is treatment. Mm -hmm. Is there treatment available? There is. Um, the treatment is not fantastic, but we do have treatment when we're still working to make to have better treatments. Um, I think we need to deal in part with the withdrawal syndrome that happens when somebody goes off of marijuana. It's subtle. It's not like it is with heroin, for example. It's more like it is with nicotine, but it's enough to make people uncomfortable, to make to interfere with their sleep, and it's enough to mm -hmm. get them to go back to using. Um, we also need to deal with the long-term effects of marijuana and. We have a problem in this country in general in recognizing that treatment can't be something that just happens in a week or even in 30 days, that it really, most of the drug problems that people have when they're addicted, they can require a long time for treatment to work. We have behavioral treatments that we know can work. We have treatments that are, that have, that are used for a number of different types of substances like cocaine and they also can work for marijuana. They're called cognitive behavioral therapy which teaches you how to avoid situations that are likely to get you to use drugs. We have um, several, we have a number of different treatments that can work if people stay in them and if they stay in them long enough and then if they continue to have some sort of support that helps them to make changes in their lifestyle just as they would with any other drug. Isn't it often difficult to get somebody to go into treatment who has been doing a drug 
or marijuana, whatever it might be? It is, and it's true for you know most drugs. Um, with marijuana, um, the numbers of people in treatment are partly related to people that are being arrested. So some of this comes from criminal justice referrals. Doesn't mean that it's not going to work. You, we know that treatment can work even if you're even if you're started um, for reasons that were not your own. Often it's family members that are insisting on somebody going in for treatment. So getting somebody to recognize that they need help and go for treatment is is very difficult. And it's true for all drugs. I mean, we know right now that we have some 20 million people who meet abuse or dependence criteria on a variety of drugs and the percentage of them that are in treatment is just minuscule it's like under 10 percent I mean we, so there are a couple things that we know also about treatment I mean obviously most people will stop using all kinds of drugs on their own maybe some external locus some some other reason why they stop fear of law enforcement their girlfriend was going to kick them out of the house but but there is a huge obviously proportion as well that does need to go to treatment and one of the fascinating numbers we saw in a, in a, in a previous slide was that you know marijuana related treatment admissions have more than doubled uh, in the past uh, 10 years, even though use rates have stayed the same. So why are the more people showing up in treatment, even though use is relatively what it was you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, give or take? And again, that goes back to the culprit being the stronger marijuana is what some people have posited, that the stronger marijuana of today is the reason why more kids are in treatment for marijuana than for all drugs and alcohol combined. I think that's pretty startling. How has it gotten to be stronger? Is it just how it's been grown? People, yeah, people are just growing it. I mean, I think it's a market thing, so people are growing more potent varieties of it, and that's been going up um, for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, it was something like 2 to 3 percent of potency of THC, and mm -hmm. then um, now it's more like 10, 11 percent, and there are other compounds in it that there may be less of, which may in fact have some countering effects to THC. Right. So we're seeing a lot of changes in, in what the marijuana plant right. is right now compared it, to what it was then. Is it just the THC that is the item that THC is the main psychoactive ingredient. It's mm -hmm. the main thing that makes people feel high. Cannabidiol, which I had mentioned earlier, is another ingredient in it, which is thought to counteract some of the effects of the THC and is also being looked at for its potential as a medicine. In fact, it may be an interesting medicine for um, schizophrenia because mm -hmm. we know that um, marijuana can make somebody psychotic mm -hmm. and, we, and, see, and cannabidiol may in fact have effects that counter that. But the modern growers have completely bred out uh, components like CBD and others in the, with the techniques they're using to increase THC. So they're accentuating the, the THC because they want you know it's much better business for them to get the high, you know make strong stuff to make more money, and they're reducing any effects that would take the psychotic, the sort of psychoactive element away. So modern marijuana does not resemble you know when we talk about marijuana being used in some cultures 6,000 years ago, etc. It, it is a totally different drug. It does not resemble that at all today. Jason, it, go ahead. Uh, as he was saying, it ranges anywhere from dealing with the genetics of it, uh, growing it overseas and selling the seeds here in the U.S., all the way down to the college students or the, the, the kids or even the adults growing here in the U.S., taking right. one strand and a, a male strand, female strand, and crossbreeding them and making a whole new strand. So it, it's the full gamut of altering it. Amazing. Well, here we are at the last few moments of our program. I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to give a final thought. Why don't we start, Susan, with you? Um, well, thank you very much for uh, having us here. And I think that um, for me, uh, you know, I've come back to this a couple of times, but for me it is so compelling that we're essentially going to be making our country less smart if we have them starting marijuana when they're young. And that is just, I, I can't imagine any parent wanting that for their child, and I can't imagine anybody wanting that for themselves. So I think those, those you know, recent information that we've gotten should be taken very seriously, and I hope people do. Very good. Jason? Uh, just increasing the, the education and the knowledge regarding marijuana, even within the law enforcement community, because even law enforcement prohibits or uh, kind of puts marijuana on a back burner at times. So if we could increase the knowledge or the, okay. the education. Very good. Kevin? Well, I think drug use and addiction is a complicated uh, uh, phenomenon. It's a complicated disorder or disease. And so our drug policies also have to be nuanced and, and, and are, are hard, and they're hard to do. And so any silver bullet, whether it's legalization on one end or mass incarceration on the other, um, isn't going to solve our problems. We need to take a comprehensive look. 
Well, that's all the time we have for today. Before we go, we'll leave you with some internet resources you might find useful regarding our topic. On behalf of Dr. Susan Weiss, Dr. Kevin Sabet, and Jason Poor, I'm Stan Rhodes. Thanks for watching Debunking Marijuana Myths.